uh, Greg Seeley here uh, coming to you from Albuquerque, New Mexico. I wish I could be with you all tonight, but uh, our friends at the National Infrastructure Bank group were kind enough to let me record a video and update to the uh, talk that I gave uh, at our last meeting, um, trying to highlight some of the challenges that are faced by local governments that are trying to implement the infrastructure funding that is coming forward now through the bipartisan infrastructure law and uh, soon through the investment uh, inflation reduction act excuse me um, what i'm hoping to do is kind of highlight a couple of uh, uh, important points that we had discussed in that last report to the national infrastructure bank audience and highlight a uh, new report that has just been released by the Brookings Institution um, from February 1st, uh, titled uh, the, the State of America's Infrastructure Decade, right? And, and how macroeconomics will play a major factor in how this money is deployed. Um, a couple of things come immediately to mind seeing that report. We, in our last talk, one of the things I highlighted, my background is in uh, helping to coordinate at the local government level um, funding uh, by tying together departments across city government. I was in a city government um, to try to help them apply for funding under the competitive grant programs designed into the bipartisan infrastructure law. In this report, some interesting things come out in the, in the data that they found. One of which is that about 7%, only 7% of the discretionary funding designed into that law has been deployed as of October of uh, this, this last year. One of the areas I highlighted for folks when I was working in local government was that this is going to be an especially difficult part for folks at the local government level to pursue because it is designed in a way for local governments that they currently do not operate in that fashion, right? Local governments are not designed to pursue that funding in that way. So you'll see across the country, there are efforts going on to try to add capacity at the local level to help governments understand that this funding is there, how to apply for it, and how to build capacity to continue to go after that funding as it gets rolled out over the next few years. And so another point in that report that's important to note is that is that level of the very high level of funding that's been deployed so far across the states, and a chart will highlight this, most states are at 90 plus percent of the funding that's been deployed so far is in the formula space because that formula funding is more built on having governments deploy as they as they have designed, right? So that puts the power and the decision making for that funding in the state government's hands. And so state government can then work directly with the communities within the state to try to deploy that funding. The issue there, of course, is that state governments aren't designed to run massive multi-billion dollar grant programs. They just aren't. In fact, many states you'll see are standing up broadband offices, infrastructure offices, scrambling to try to get together the capacity to deploy out this formula funding. So in, in both cases here, what you're finding is that projects are being announced. And if you go on to build.gov, you can see a map and a list of all of these amazing projects and the billions of dollars that are being rolled out. What happens is if you go in and look at the data behind those those announced projects, what you will find is that's exactly what they are, announced. That's not money that's actually going out the door. Those aren't projects that are actually getting built yet. Those are projects that have had a press release and that's about it. One of the reasons I'm so passionate about a national infrastructure bank is that I feel that that design creates a long-term structure that will allow governments to approach funding and to approach the bank in the way that they actually operate. So state governments will be able to work with the National Infrastructure Bank in a way that works with the actual jurisdiction and functions of state government, whereas local governments can approach the National Infrastructure Bank and vice versa. Very critically, a National Infrastructure Bank can take a proactive approach to building capacity to help local governments to get ahead of problems before their problems. 
So I think that's a great way that an infrastructure bank can actually solve some of these really critical issues with the funding, though it its goal is shared by us all. We want to see infrastructure improve. It's the design. The design of the of the, how this policy is built is critical, and it has to be designed in a way to work with governments how they actually exist and operate on a day-to-day -day basis. My final point for everyone tonight is that I want to point out something that was said in an event. Again, I'm going to quote the Brookings Institution here because they held an event on January 25th with two panels to explore the infrastructure funding that is out there. And the event was actually titled um, Accelerating Federal, State, and Local Investment uh, for Infrastructure Workforce. The workforce issue is going to be one of the most critical bottlenecks and, and issues that we have to solve. Because even if, and I mentioned this in my last meeting, even if as a local government, we apply for funding for an infrastructure project, and let's say we're successful and we win that, despite the fact that it takes many, many hours to design and build that project and, and that grant, let's say all, everything works out right and you win that, can you actually spend that money? Do you have the capacity in your local area to be able to build that road or update the, the rail crossing area, uh, port uh, capabilities, capacity? Did the programs go on and on and on? And they're very important programs. But can you actually spend that money? And one of the major factors of can you spend that money is do we have the workforce available to meet the moment? Uh, a gentleman by the name of Robert Blaine on that call, who's now with the National League of Cities, was formerly with the administration in Jackson, Mississippi. And he talks about the fact that if they had applied for discretionary funding for their water system under this law, the way it's designed, their chances of securing that funding and deploying it to try to address their water issues, which as we all know now have become a major issue, it's gonna take a long time to fix, their chances of getting and securing that competitive funding would have been 